I'm very pleased to welcome Mike Weiner, who's a climate scientist at Lawrence Berkeley <coughs> National Lab. He was a co-author of the 2009 White House Report on Climate Change, and he's a co-author of the upcoming IPCC report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is where all the governments get together and try to agree, of course they don't, on what's happening with the climate. So uh, anyway, maybe we'll get a sneak preview of what's going to happen. So, Michael. Thank you, Jim. So what I'm going to walk you through today is um, a little bit about climate change, um, some basics about it um, so that you're, you're, you're well versed in uh, at least cocktail party conversations of uh, climate change, since this is a subject of many cocktail party conversations that I've found anyway. Um, but we'll also talk about uh, the computing aspects of it and, uh, and, and why this is interesting um, to computational scientists. And uh, um, I'm actually in the computational research division up, and, up at the lab and um, uh, and I've uh, recruited some colleagues in the last couple of years who um, are finding it, I think, rewarding from, a, uh, from both a scientific view because it's an interesting problem, but also because of the computational aspects. It's, it's, it, it, the high performance computing is critical, and um, what has happened in the last two years really is big data has become um, important, and I think we're really on the bleeding edge of that. So, um, I like to start out with a, with a, 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 a saying that I, I learned from, well, I had the privilege of hearing the, the great uh, scientist, the founder of Chaos Theory, uh, uh, Ed Lawrence, uh, give a, uh, an after-dinner banquet speech. And the title was, Climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. And, um, and I like this definition um, because people often say, well, weather, climate, you know, what, what are you talking about? And, um, uh, this, this, uh, this puts it in plain English. Climate is really the long-term statistics of weather. It's not just the average. It's also the statistics of extreme events. And so there's a lot into that. Um, uh, you, you might think a lot of what you'll see you know, from the IPCC reports and, and the national, U.S. National Assessment and in, and in the press is, are, are changes in, in average climate. And... Um, the problem is nobody lives in the average. You know, you live, we basically live in the noise, and so the noise is the weather. So I would like to go over a little bit about global warming and, you know, whether or not you believe in it, you, sh you should. Um, uh, I could pick a whole number of quotes from the IPCC, um, uh, except for the ones from the AR5, since that's not out there yet, and there is a process for that. Um, I like these from 2001, which is not the most recent one, but the one before it, that says an increasing body of observations gives a collective picture of a warming world and other changes in the climate system. And it's that part, the other changes in the climate system actually are the most interesting part. The warming bit is so well established, it's not scientifically challenging. Um, about 20 years ago, I was working on detection of at and attribution with Ben Santer at, at Livermore, and we had had a paper out and about warming. And, and I said to him, I said, you know, in 20 years, these kinds of exercises will be assigned to undergraduates because the problem just gets easier and easier. And that, that has indeed been the case. And then the next one is there's new and stronger evidence that most of the warming observed over the last 50 years is attributable to human activities. And that statement has been made, uh, both of these statements have been made stronger in the last report and, of course, will be made stronger in the next one. Um, I think I have the words on, yes. From the AR4, the words were, warming is unequivocal. Um, besides having trouble pronouncing that word, I had to look it up. It means it pretty much the way it is. And, um, and here's some of the evidence for it. Um, this plot in the upper um, uh, right-hand corner is, um, is, are from thermometers. And... Uh, um, these are reconstructed um, by, uh, um, well, now four groups um, uh, dating from the middle of the 19th century. And I, I, sh I should add that this, this data is from um, the, the group in, in Britain uh, from the University of East Anglia, which is the home of the climate gate nonsense. Um, my emails were in some of that, um, uh, and I'm not happy about any of that. Um, but what I was most unhappy about were the opportunities that were used by the skeptics to attack friends of mine, Phil Jones, namely, 
who did a very careful job reconstructing that picture. And uh, what I'm also very unhappy about is that a professor here at Berkeley, Professor Muller from the physics department, challenged that and said that this was basically dishonest. And the reason he was upset was that low quality, um, low quality data was not used. And an expert judgment was, was uh, invoked to determine which, sta which stations were used and which weren't. And so he wrote a series of very nasty editorials about um, how uh, this was not transparent, despite the fact that it was. The, the, the algorithms and rationales were quite, quite in the public domain. Um, and, um, and said, well, you know, only me, a Berkeley physics professor, can actually do this right. And he developed a statistical algorithm and published everything before he even had any results out on the, on the internet, which you can do nowadays, of course. And, um, and uh, at the end of the day, he came up with the exact same picture. Wiggles and all. I mean, not just the trend, but all the wiggles are the same. And, um, and sort of recanted um, and said, well, they actually were careful. Um, I found that very disingenuous. That's the end of my rant. <laughs> but the, 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 um, the lesson is, is that this is a nasty business. You know, I'm here just as a scientist, but very nasty, if you get in this business, very nasty things will be said about you from both sides, um, the denialists and the alarmists, if you're a careful scientist. Um, and you get used to it. So that's that. Um, the other picture in the lower part is uh, extending the record back. This is actually very controversial too. That's the hockey stick. You might have heard about that. Another friend of mine, Mike Mann. Um, I suffered through two and a half days of statisticians discussing this picture. And they all had different things to say. And they all came up with a hockey stick. Different curves. If you play hockey, you know what I mean. Um, but they all looked like a hockey stick. And basically, you see that the, the uh, temperature change at the end, at the most recent part of this record, is pretty much unprecedented. So, so just to contrast the horizontal axes in the three different plots? So it's Our, a little yes. hard to read in the back. Yes. Uh, so so the, the, uh, the, the thermometer record goes from 1860 to 2000. And the, uh, the, the paleo data goes from the year 1000 to, to the 1000 years. Then the other plot is um, the, the, the axis on that, I guess, is quite a bit longer. Um, and that shows uh, concentrations of greenhouse gases. And of course, at the end of this, you see that, the, uh, that they, at, short, at 2000, the concentrations are much higher than they've been for the previous 2,000 years. Um, and in fact, um, with the concentrations now exceed, exceeding 400 parts per million or approaching four, 400 parts per million, it's the highest concentration of, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere for the last 3 million years. So this is a fact that the global mean surface air temperature is increasing. Um, the interesting scientific questions, or they were the interesting, they think they've been answered now, is, is this warming due to human factors? Um, this becomes a signal to noise problem. So you have to, and, and there is only one planet, so that's a that makes it a difficult thing, and that's where modeling comes into play. And I think more interesting is, do we understand the causes and the effects of, this, of the warming? And then what everybody wants to know is what's going to happen in the future, and more importantly to the computational aspect is people want to know what's going to happen where I live, and that becomes then a question of scale. Well, I went the wrong way, I'm sorry. So the evidence for recent climate change is not just in the temperature record. Um, in fact, around 1990, when these original papers were coming out, people said, well, and legitimately so, skeptics said, well, if the, if the temperature is warming, then a whole bunch of other things go along with that. And, um, and in fact, that's been, that's been shown to be the case. Um, uh, from satellites, we know that water vapor in the atmosphere has increased. Um, we know that very accurately, in fact. And I'm sorry about that. It keeps on moving on me. Um, the air temperature in the lower uh, part of the atmosphere, called the troposphere, that's been documented quite clearly in, in, uh, by satellites. 
Um, the sea ice is declining. Um, ocean heat content is increasing. Uh, uh, glaciers are also, land glaciers are also in, re in retreat. Um, you can go on and on, actually. So how do we know that this climate change is due to humans? And, and I like to say that um, this is not rocket science. In fact, it's steam engine science. And these guys, Fourier starting, but, but um, in particular, uh, 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 Tyndall um, measured the, um, the, the radiative properties of, um, of, uh, of gases in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in the late 19th century and, uh, and found that dipolar molecules like carbon dioxide and, and water are very effective at trapping heat. In fact, methane, which is more complex, is even better than, say, just oxygen, a simple, a simple atom. Uh, um, oh, this, this is annoying. Sorry about that. Um, Arrhenius, in fact, calculated the, the, uh, the uh, climate sensitivity, which is a measure that we use today to, um, to uh, I'm just going to go out of this for a minute, it stops doing that, um, that, that um, he estimated the, uh, the response of the global temperature to, say, a doubling of CO2 to be 4 degrees centigrade. And the IPCC estimate is 2 to 6 degrees. So he was right there in 1904. So you might ask, what have we learned since then? Um, we've learned a lot. Um, in fact, we've learned that there is actually a big uncertainty on this number. And, uh, and that's, that's one of the great, that is still one of the great uh, open issues. Um, it turns out that this measure of the sensitivity of the climate to uh, increases in greenhouse gases is, has a, the, the, uh, the estimates of this are, are as a probability density distribution, are actually uh, uh, has a very long tail. So um, we're very sure that the climate sensitivity is not under two degrees for a doubling of carbon dioxide, but we're not so sh we're not nearly as confident that it's less that it's that it's not greater than six degrees. And I'm going to skip the next part because it keeps on. Um, I want to go back to the big screen here. So here's some projections of. Um, of, of future global mean surface air temperature. And um, we show here uh, two, Jim, are you good at PowerPoint and turning off the automated thing? Sorry, I'm not sure why. Um, yeah. Um, oh, that'll take too long. This is a big file. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll, we'll live with it. Um, so anyway, the, you see two curves here. One is a low emissions, and the other is a high emissions scenario. And you can see they're they're different. They, the uh, the the shaded region is is our estimate is one estimate of the natural variability. Um, and you can see that these two plots separate around the middle of the century. And that's actually a key point: is that um, that when you get into the policy of climate change, what are you going to do about it? Since we know it's coming. Um, actions you take today are probably not going to have any effect until the middle of the century. So there's no instant gratification. And that's what makes this a difficult political problem is that um, uh, you're basically asking people to go to great expense now for a benefit that they may not even live long enough to see. I'm going to skip that. Skip that. Here's some. These are a variant of um, um, some maps I made for the U.S. National, the upcoming U.S. National Assessment, showing um, the effect on the United States of different um, of different uh, um, uh, emission scenario, ranging from low emission scenarios at the top, around here, to very high. Um, what I call this one RCP 8.5 is the no policy scenario, where we don't do anything, business as usual kind of thing. The units are. Um, are, are centigrade, and uh, the top one, RCP 2.6, is what you would call a very aggressive mitigation policy designed to keep the global average um, change to two degrees. There's a uh, body called the uh, UNFCCC, which stands for United Nations Framework Climate Change something, and they've, they've uh, stated that uh, uh, global mean changes of of temperature above two degrees is dangerous, and we should keep that below that. And um, so this this 
particular scenario. Now, a scenario is basically a, a thought experiment about how people will behave and how, they, and how much uh, greenhouse gas they will emit. And this, this one that is, was constructed to keep the temperature at two degrees at the middle of this century and then stable after that requires negative emissions of carbon dioxide. You know, what does that mean? Well, it means that you're going to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere by some technology that is yet to be invented to do that at scale. So it's a very wishful thinking kind of, of, uh, of uh, technology. And beyond that, if you were to, um, to do such a thing, you have to keep on doing it. And um, uh, so it, forever. And so in order to keep the planet at two degrees, A, you have to invent some magical technology to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and B, you have to do it to the end of time, at least on human life, on human species um, timescales. Um, I'll leave you to, to think of how likely that is. Um, the bottom one, on the other hand, is, is just plow along like nothing is, matters. And instead of two degrees, you get something more like six or eight degrees in the average temperature uh, change over the United States. And in fact, most of, the, most of where people live are going to look similar to that. Winter temperatures, oh, go ahead. That's two to six degrees. The average would be two to six, would be in that, this uh, RCP 85, no policy scenario, would be uh, six degrees warmer. Over, over uh, every year. No, the, 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 the average over a long period of time would be six degrees at the end of this century. And actually, at the end of the next century, it'd be closer to 10. Um, what I don't like about the two degree scenario is, besides the fact that it's probably not going to happen, is that um, the implication that two degrees, that, two de that above two degrees is dangerous, that means that two degrees is safe. And in fact, there are serious impacts that we've already had from climate change. We've only had less than a degree, just about a degree. At two degrees, the impacts become quite significant. Um, there, you can pick your favorite. Hurricanes are certainly influenced. I'll show a little bit on that. But I think the one that, um, so the more, some of the more interesting research at Berkeley is on, the, on uh, food security. Um, it turns out that uh, most of the major food crops have a strong temperature sensitivity and, we're, and the way we grow them now are in the sweet spot of that. And so if you change the temperature, we get out of the sweet spot. And in particular, corn production in Iowa, um, which is where most, <laughs> which is a tremendously productive place, um, would be subject to much more volatility. And, uh, and uh, the economists can tell us will tell us that that then leads to wild swings, fluctuation in prices, which causes all sorts of other social problems. I'm going to skip this one. Um, this is another picture. This is from the draft um, U.S. National Climate Assessment Report, which is uh, the IPCC goes under, the international report goes under a different set of rules than, um, than, uh, um, than the national assessment. So the national assessment the, US, the, the, the IPCC goes out four times for expert review. Now, anybody can be an expert, but um, uh, it, 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 the, the, there, is some, there is a filter. The, the, the US, U.S. report went out once for public comment, and the comments are interesting. Um, uh, so this is, and the, the problem I had with it is it was reported even though, widely in the press, even though it's a draft. And lots of things will be changed between the draft and the final version. And you, my, my animations are killing me here. This is, um, this is a plot to show you that changes in precipitation, now this is different than temperature, this is a consequence of the change in, 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 um, in, in, um, in temperature are different for each season in the United States. And in fact, in the winter and spring, patterns look kind of the same. You have a serious moistening in the uh, in the north and uh, and a drying in the southwest and the regions that are are hatched the striped parts are regions where um, where I, I say in plain English that there's high confidence that the change will be large relative to natural variations 
And, um, and the white regions are regions where I'm confident that the, change, the future changes will be small compared to, um, to natural variations. Um, that latter one actually, the, the first one gets me in trouble with the denialists and the second one gets me in trouble with the alarmists. Um, they would much rather have me show that summer picture with a lot more brown in it than it has. But um, in particular in the southwest, but the southwest is a place where the variability from one year to the next is a lot because they have the, the Mexican monsoon. <laughs> Can you please? That would be great. And, and, uh, um, and so uh, uh, this is actually a new thing that will be in the AR5, this representation of, of confidence in big changes and small changes. And I think that that's a, that's a new thing, and I think it's really important because you don't want to make decisions that are based on on um, on faulty information. And if the and yeah, so this is a different version of PowerPoint than what I just did on my laptop. Set up show, see if there's a way to disable them. That's what I'm looking for. Right here, set up show. Oh, oh, this is at the bottom. That's why. Here we go. Manually. Thank you very much. God, that has been bugging me. The last last two talks I gave, I've had this problem. It's really embarrassing when it's in front of 600 people. Um, so yeah, so that's that's what we're that's what we're trying to say here, and and um, and tech, the technical definition here, just in case you care, is this is this is a projection from from uh, in this case 40 different climate models um, uh, built by uh, large teams of of uh, science, both physical scientists and computer scientists um, across the world at different modeling centers. And what I did is I took the, the projected change from each of these models and averaged them to form a multi-model average. And then there, uh, these were the runs of simulating the future, but there were also runs that, are, that we used to quantify the noise where we, um, we don't change anything. So it would be a, a, a planet that humans weren't on, so a pre-industrial planet, as it were. Um, or maybe a pre-human kind of planet if we weren't here. Um, and, um, and I can calculate a, a, a standard deviation from that across time. And so I calculate the 20-year mean and calculate the standard deviation across a thousand-year run of the 20-year mean. And so if in the hatched regions, the signal is twice as large as that. And in the white regions, it's less than one times that. And so there are some regions where there's colors but no hatching. And there, I'm not making a confidence statement at all. It just is what it is. And so what the arrows were coming up and telling us is that those, those hatching numbers and the white come basically from the arithmetic. But really, our true confidence comes from understanding what's going on. And we do understand in these plots what's going on in the hatched regions. The, warm, the, the, the warmer air holds more water. And that plays a big role in the high latitudes, where warming is actually larger than it is in other places. And so what this is actually telling us is that bitter cold winters would be very rare. Uh, I went to school in Wisconsin, and um, bitter cold winters were like minus 20 Fahrenheit. And it's beautiful outside because the, the, the air is too cold to hold any water, so the sky is blue. Those days will be less frequent, and so it will, it will snow more. In the southwest, it's actually more complicated because it's also warmer, but there's a circulation change called there's a circulation called the Hadley circulation, which is what defines the tropics, and the, that that circulation will expand. So these tropical regions expand, and so um, that that change in the motion of the atmosphere uh, causes a drying in this region. And I'm going to teach a course in the fall, and that will be one of the topics, well, the impacts of that drying region on Central America and Mexico. Here's an animation of, of, from one model of, um, of global warming in a minute, over 300 years. Um, so we're starting here in 1872. What's plotted here is the, the, um, the temperature at that year minus a recent period, 1980 to 2000. So hopefully this will go. So you can see it started out colder, of course, in 1890 than it, than, um, it was in, 
the 1980-2000 period. And it's, it's not really changing much um, prior to, this, to the Second World War. Um, in the 70s, all of a sudden, the blue starts going away. And as you get into, uh, into the 21st century, it starts getting uh, uh, to warm colors. In this model, and this is fairly unique to this model, it started in the southern hemisphere. Some other models started differently. Um, but you can see it starts getting warmer and warmer and, and isn't going back to any blue colors to speak of, except for a, one strange uh, thing in the, uh, in the North Atlantic, which involves f flow from the Greenland Straits. And by the end of, uh, by the, end of the uh, uh, next century, you see a result that is actually a little cooler than the, uh, than, than the result I showed you from uh, the no policy scenario. And that's a result of the fact that this is a rel relatively old movie and that no policy scenario hadn't been uh, devised when I made this. But it, it, it is uh, important that you, you take home that the, uh, the high latitude changes are, are larger than the low latitude changes. In general, changes are larger over land than they are over ocean which is unfortunate since we live in the land. Could you say roughly what the resolution on that simulation was? This was a coarse resolution because I made this when you first started having me give this lecture, <laughs> which is some years ago now. <laughs> I think this is a, uh, a, uh, a four degree. So the grid boxes were 400 kilometers. We're going to get a lot better than that in my next animation. And this is my research interest is extreme weather in a changing climate. And just to show you some pictures of real events, um, in the upper um, uh, uh, left-hand corner is, a, um, is something called an atmospheric river. You might have heard the, the, um, the uh, uh, weather forecasters call it a pineapple express. Basically, when these events happen, you have copious amounts of tropical water transported to, say, California. We had one in December that caused a landslide up at the lab, actually. Um, they happen a couple of times a year. Um, they can deli they they are the when when we get one of those warm storms where it rains a real lot and it, but it's not real cold um, that is usually an atmospheric river. Um, Hurricane Katrina is in the lower um, uh, lower right hand side. That's a particularly interesting storm as you might imagine. Uh, this funny looking thing in the upper um, uh, right hand corner is called the Deresho, or a Deresho. Um, I happened to be in Washington, D.C. the day after that, and power was, I had relatives in two states that lost power from the same storm, both Ohio and Virginia. It was a remarkably coherent event. This is not something we simulate right now in climate models um, because of the scales, although I have a hope that we could. Um, and then the other one is, a, uh, is a, uh, an extratropical cyclone, and those happen all over uh, the planet. We don't know. We don't know. It's hard to imagine they're not. Um, um, it was a very violent storm. But, we, but the answer is no, we don't know. So historically, climate modeling has been limited by computational speed. When I started in this business in 1990, um, we started the, these, this first coordinated efforts. And climate modeling is a remarkably coordinated activity, despite all the contention from the outside, inside the community, we get along pretty well. And in fact, we, we have a series of standardized uh, configurations, and the data is collected at Livermore, at the Program from Climate Model Diagnostics and Air Comparison. I used to be in that group. And it's shared widely. And so you can, anyone can go and download uh, terabytes of model output nowadays. Um, but that started in 1990. In the, called the AMIP, which is Atmospheric Model Intercomparison Project. And the Department of Energy allocated a bunch of time at the NERSC Center, which at that time was at Livermore, and, um, but it's now here at Berkeley Lab. And it took a, a whole year for people to run a 10-year calculation. To simulate 10 years took one whole year for most of these groups. And the resolution was um, uh, just really coarse. It had 10 vertical levels. And then the horizontal was divided by 64 by 32, which was probably about 800 kilometers on the side. Um, so it's very coarse. In 2011, for the, the CCSM-5 was released, um, or CCSM-4, I'm sorry. Um, that's a mistake. 
Um, that was released in preparation for the AR5, the IPCC report, and a fully coupled ocean. So the, in 1990, it was just the atmosphere, but in 2011, it's the ocean and the ice, the sea ice and the atmosphere, all of which are the major uh, components. There's also the land, which is relatively inexpensive. And they were getting 15 simulated years per day instead of 10 years in a year. So it's a, that is a remarkable thing in itself. But then the resolution is so much higher. And the atmosphere model is one degree, so that's about 100 kilometers instead of 800. And, the res and you see what the grid sizes are. The vertical resolution is only doubled, um, and that probably it needs to go up. And, but then there's this ocean, which, which is of equal complexity. Um, there's less uh, physics going on in the ocean. It's mostly a dynamical problem, so it's a little bit cheaper, but still a, a, of a similar order of magnitude. And instead of running 10 years now, we typically one, run one or two centuries. And, and I guess I don't have this on here, we, back in 1990, we did one run per modeling center per this, this particular scenario. Now we have multiple scenarios of the future. You saw some of that in that, that uh, plot of the maps of temperature change. And everybody does multiple realizations. The climate is a chaotic system. And so we're interested in the statistics. And so the, a good way to get that is you perturb the initial conditions a little bit. The weather changes after a few weeks of simulation, the simulated weather, but the long-term climate statistics are, are similar. So the complexity of these calculations has increased in, in multiple dimensions. Yes? So I'm really curious. How sensitive are the results of the model to the granularity? Like the coarse grain versus the more fine grain? How gonna, different we, you're the You're going to see that. And... Um, and, well, here's the next slide. You, you, um, uh, but I'm going to have some videos, too. So we're not there at 100 kilometers in production models. Um, I think, at the very least, in order to say something about regional climate change, we do need 10 kilometers. And we probably need 100 vertical uh, levels to fully exploit Probably, probably uh, the greatest to fully investigate the, what's the greatest uncertainty in the, all this business, and that's the role of clouds and in their interaction with solar and infrared radiation. And um, and actually, I've, I've I've been looking with some of my colleagues in the computational part of our division into a new class of models where instead of approximating clouds by what we call a parameterization, because even at 10 kilometers, there are no 10 clouds that are 10 kilometers going down to a one kilometer model. So 1990, 800 kilometers go to one kilometer. It's a big range since, you know, it, it's a two-dimensional problem in the horizontal. And I estimated that we need to get 28 petaflops sustained in order to get that now, in order to be able to simulate that in a time that we could actually do any meaningful science. And in the ocean, um, we really need to get down below 50 kilometers, perhaps even 10, to, um, to resolve something called mes mesoscale eddies, which are, are uh, important for transporting ocean uh, heat content uh, um, uh, in the horizontal dimensions. The nice news about that is that those kinds of calculations are being done now. They're, um, they're what you might call a heroic calculation. And, I've been around long enough to know that heroic calculations now become pretty routine in five to six years. Um, and I talked about ensembles earlier. Que question? Please. So there's been news about predictions about the Gulf Stream, which is, of course, a much finer resolution event. Can that, does that show up in these models? In fact, um, it's cr in order to get the location of the, the um, Gulf Stream correct, it's critical to have high resolution. Um, I don't have a video of that, unfortunately. But um, if you have, if your model is too coarse, you simulate a Gulf Stream. But what happens is it splits off from um, North America. The real Gulf Stream splits off from North America, um, I guess, around New York, and then makes a beeline to to Ireland. And that's why the UK climate isn't as cold as it would be, given that, given its high latitude. And it, if in order to get that correct, you have to have a high-resolution model because if you don't, the, the Gulf Stream just keeps on going and goes way too far north and doesn't uh, kick off to the east. 
But here's a question that, that addresses, or a slide that addresses your, que your question directly, and it shows the wintertime precipitation over the United States in three different models in the observations. Red is higher, um, the green is lower. And you can see that in a 300 kilometer model, um, you don't get, you don't reproduce the, uh, the, uh, the, the high values in the southeast that you see in the lower right panel, which are observations. And you don't really even see it at 75 kilometers. It's sort of starting to, to kick in. But by 50, all of a sudden, it, it, it drops in. And, and this is actually, it turns out the United States is particularly sensitive to resolution, the precipitation, simulated precipitation. And it's because of the Rockies. As you uh, increase uh, the resolution, you more realistically represent the, uh, the heights of the mountains because the mountains are smoothed as you, um, you know, to be from their real elevation to be uh, representative of grid point. But where the real benefits of, um, of, uh, of higher resolution comes into play are looking at extreme precipitation. And that's one of my areas of, of specialty. This is a paper I wrote. Um, in the, um, again, in the lower right-hand corner are observations. And um, in this case, the units are millimeters per day. And you can see in the southeast, it exceeds that, as it does in the, uh, in, 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 um, the mountain region. Now, now, the extreme precipitation measure here is something called the 20-year return value. The 20-year uh, return value, if this climate was stationary, would be a value to expect to see um, once every 20 years over the period of a long time. But of course, the climate is changing. And that definition doesn't hold because this, this measure of extremes actually changes. It increases. Um, so a better way to think of the 20-year return value is, um, is that value that has a 1, in, a 1 over 20 or a 5% chance of actually happening this year. So it's a fairly rare event, um, but not so rare that it's not going to happen during your life. And you can see that at 200 kilometers, which is the 2-degree calculation in the upper left, um, the values simulated are far too low. And, and you're starting to get it at 100, but at, two, at a 50, which is the, the one in the right, or left, rather, the lower left, um, then the values are approaching the right magnitude. They are not correct, though, um, and um, that is a result of, so, of other approximations within the model. And so what this study shows is that um, the resolution is sort of a necessary, but but not sufficient condition to be able to simulate this kind of phenomena. Now I'm going to show the movie. And um, I've got movies on this website, and you can find them on YouTube as well. Um, and we're putting more on YouTube as we go along. So let's go to the first movie while well, it saves my stuff. So this, this picture, this movie is uh, showing water vapor. Um, in of calculations that we've done just over the last year um, at quarter degree, which is 25 kilometers. This is pretty much state of the art. There are only four groups in the world that can do this. We're the fourth. Um, the others are the Japanese um, uh, MRI, Meteorological Research Institute. They were the first. They've been do they they have bl are blessed with very large computing systems dedicated to climate modeling. And then the, uh, the Princeton group, uh, the NOAA laboratory, the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab, and um, the mo more recently, just very recently, uh, the UK Met Office, and now us, using the CAM-5, which stands for Community Atmospheric Model. We did not write this model. It's a model that's publicly available. Um, um, it's this, the de facto US national climate model. There are a couple, but this is the one that, that is, is available to the public. Um, and developed by the Department of Energy and the National Fi Science Foundation at the labs and at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. So let's watch the movie. So it's a total column integrated water vapor. So this is all the water vapor looking down. And what you see is the weather, simulated weather. Um, uh, you'll see some hurricanes. I picked this period to show hurricanes. Um, there's also a lot of uh, uh, weather fronts going through over land and at the, higher, at the mid latitudes. Um, it's a fascinating movie. I've spent hours looking at these things. Um, if you're in the right part, oh, and now we're going to go to addressing your question about resolution. The top panel is 200 kilometers, and the lower panel is, is the 25. And um, 
when I showed this movie at Berkeley Rep, I said, if you're sitting in the back, they might look the same, especially if you take your glasses off. That's good news because all the IPCC reports and the U.S. National Assessment and our literature is based on models that are at that high, at the resolution on the high, the top panel. Let me just finish, I'll get to you. Um, and, um, and so the large scale structures in the atmosphere are, are well simulated at 100 kilometers or 200 kilometers. But we don't get the details. And so for my interest of extreme weather, we have to have these higher resolutions. It turns out that the mean climate statistics at the large scale are not particularly made better by high resolution. But at the small scales, it's the only way to go. Your question, please. Uh, are all models at a regular grid intervals, or are there models that also have sort of a Ah, that's a really good question, actually. Uh, this model is based, and I'm going to talk about this, actually. Um, uh, this model is a regular finite, volume, finite uh, latitude longitude grid, and that's going to be right at the end. And I have 211, right? 211. Yeah, okay, we'll have time for that. The, and like I said, this stuff is on YouTube, and, and, if, you, and if you search for me, you probably find it. Um, somebody said we need to. And put, I think I just posted yes, either okay. this yeah, on, on the website. Somebody said I need to put Dancing Cat in the, descri just in the description yeah. now. And they said, well, how about Dancing Cat 5, since it makes Cat 5 storms? <laughs> well, no, that's bad. <laughs> you know, but a cheap way to get, a, a cheap way to get hits. Um, this is a simulation. We just did this one, and, and um, hopefully you'll find it interesting. The arrows are wind speed. When they get above a certain threshold, and I don't know what it is, um, they're turned orange. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the blue shading is, um, is water vapor again. So it's an a it, what happens here is, I'm going to stop it right here, right there. So this is your classic Pineapple Express kind of, 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 of storm. And what's really cool about this, and I only, no, I only noticed this yesterday, because uh, my colleague Prabhat made this movie, is right in here, where you see the Central Valley. Now the, pic the, 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 the background picture is a satellite picture, that's not simulated, but it gives you, the lo locations are right. At this resolution, we resolve the Central Valley and we resolve the coastal range of California and the Sierra. And what happens is the moisture from this storm goes over the coastal range, but not the Sierra. And we don't get that at low resolution. It'll make atmospheric rivers. They tend to be broader, um, but they don't have this level of detail and realism. And so there are a lot of people out there who will criticize high resolution models and say don't, don't make what basically that they're saying is they don't it doesn't make what I will care about better and if they care about the mean climate statistics that's probably the case but if you care about the realism of storms and trying to cut the to um, to uh, describe the, poten the potential for changes in these storms and, and I don't know what the changes in these kind of storms are going to be quite frankly because this is so new but we have to be able to have this kind of, of realism. That's 25 kilometer resolution? That's the same 25 kilometer model. And so um, um, I'm going to run it through one more time and you get, we'll, we'll, we'll just talk through it. Uh, let's start at the beginning. So you also see an extra tropical cyclone form here at some point, right there. See that, that, those colored arrows? That's spinning around real fast. That's called an extra tropical cyclone as opposed to a tropical cyclone, which is a hurricane. Extra tropical cyclones are much larger. Typically, this one is not, but typically for us, they form off a predominant low pattern called the Aleutian Low. There's a similar one off of Iceland called the Icelandic Low, which influences weather in Europe. So let's go back to PowerPoint. So here I'm showing um, from a long simulation of that 25 kilometer model, a simulation from 1979 to 2005, all the tracks of hurricanes. And on the top panel is, is observed, and on the bottom is as simulated. <clears throat> the colors represent intensity. The purple is tropical um, depression. Um, the tropical storm is a little, little less purple. Uh, 
um, category one is blue and category five is red. And so this shows all those. I'm going to peel off the, um, the tropical storms and just go cat one to cat five. And you can see that there are similarities and differences here. Um, <clears throat> the similarity is they, they're kind of in the right, uh, the right places in general, um, especially in the Atlantic. In the Pacific, um, there are too many right in the middle. Um, don't know the reason for that yet. We're working on it. Um, the interesting thing that my colleague Cheng Ta Chen has found comparing our model with one of the other four, the Japanese model, is we do better with the American model in the Atlantic, and they do better over the West Pacific. <laughs> if I understood the reason for that, I'd have a nice paper. <laughs> but it is sort of an interesting coincidence that the, peop that the model works better closer to where the people who wrote it live. <laughs> The other interesting thing about this model, now two of those four models can make category five, four and five storms, and ours is one of them, and um, the other one being the Japanese model. The other two, the other two, simula the other two modeling groups, even though they're similar resolutions, their storms aren't as strong. And that's another interesting question that I don't think we have a good answer for yet. Um, but these are what we call intense hurricanes, category four and category five. And, um, and uh, it's hard to tell from this, but we, oh, I think I have the numbers for, well, I don't, I don't think I have the numbers for this. There are 15 per year on average globally, and we get eight and a half. Um, but for, oh, here it is. So, um, so will you tell us at a high level what the differences in the models are? Well, there are differences in the dynamical formulations, which is probably important. Um, but more critically are differences in the, in the, what we call the parameterizations, which are the representations of unresolved processes like clouds. Um, um, so subgrid scale physics, most of which is probably tied up in moisture, moist physics. So here's a comparison of, the, of our model to the um, to observations. And so the total number of tropical cyclones, I think that's 30 knots, is, um, is 87 per year. We get 84, so that's really good. And for hurricanes, which is 16 knots, I think. Um, it's around 50, and that's how it breaks down. And the only one I know is that the number of Cat 4 and Cat 5s in the real world is 15, plus or minus something. <coughs> but the reason why I showed the track thing is um, that actually was a very challenging computational um, uh, task in that um, the, the data to look at it for that was 11 terabytes. Now, this simulation made 100 terabytes of model output. And 11 or 13, I think, is what we had to read in to do that calculation to make that map. It would have taken years to do this on my workstation, um, probably five or more. And so Prabhat um, has developed a way to do this on a, in a very simple parallel way. Basically, it's, it's, it's in a lot of files. Um, and so originally, we, we basically assigned re process. The, so it, the abstraction to doing event identification, like event being, in this case, a hurricane, is um, you search through the data set at some time interval. In our case, every three hours, we, every three simulated hours, we, we output, which is why the database is so large. <coughs> and we look for candidate storms. And um, that's the expensive part of the calculation because you've got to plow through a lot of data and the search algorithm scales poorly. Um, then, then you've actually made this huge data reduction from terabytes to megabytes, or kilobytes maybe. And then you basically say, OK, are the events at this time related, the candidate events related at this time related to the ones at the next time? That turns out to be really fast. Um, so we do that serially, but that first step we can, it's trivially parallelizable over time since each time identifying the candidates is, um, is, is just what happened now. And so we originally just put one file to a processor, um, but now we, now we actually do one time step. Does this seem like a natural candidate for MapReduce to do that? It research? is a MapReduce algorithm, actually. And it works really well. And so, um, so, uh, Basically, if you, if you run it on enough processors, you can, take, you can go from several years to half an hour. 
Um, I've actually even done this myself, running his code on 36,000 processors, and I ran 10 years in about an hour and a half, um, 10 simulated years. And so it, it works real well. Um, but once we did that calculation, then we can do all sorts of manipulations on that, that um, um, now just a couple of megabytes worth of data. Um, this is a, another way of looking at um, uh, the realism of, of, a, of, of these storms. What's plotted on the y-axis is the, uh, the sea level pressure, the minimum sea level pressure in the middle of the storm, and on the x-axis is the maximum wind speed for the observations and the, um, and the model. And um, you can see it actually does pretty well in both the North Atlantic and in the Northwest Pacific, in spite of the fact that we have too few storms there. At least the ones we have are realistic. I'm going to skip that. Oh, this was another thing we did looking at that output from the, uh, from the tracking algorithm was look at the density of tracks and uh, as, a, as a function of month. Uh, the observations are on the, uh, the left two columns and the models on the right two. And um, there are differences um, that are interesting, uh, uh, one of which is that, that storms tend to form a little too close to the coast of Africa in the model. Um, I don't fully understand that yet. It's interesting. So the whole cyclogenesis process is complicated. And in fact, when I first discovered that this model would do it, was, I was so excited I ran up and down and told my boss. And, and, um, and um, we discovered it by accident. The code had crashed. I couldn't figure it out. And I called up a friend of mine. who I knew I'd run it. And I said, can you send me, a, can you send me some output so I can look at it? And I, um, and I, and I animated it in a, in a program. Uh, that we do for visualization. And um, I was looking at temperature at 500 millibars, which is sort of the middle of the troposphere. And what hurricanes do is they take warm air from the surface and they transport it up the middle through the core of the end. And, and um, so I was looking at this movie and this dot was moving across the Pacific. <laughs> and I knew immediately that was a hurricane, except I also knew that climate models didn't make hurricanes. And so that was, a, that was a, one of those aha moments that the, the, that uh, obviously got me excited. This is the only result I have yet, because these calculations are still expensive, um, show, of, a, of a, a projection of the future. And this is why I was ranting about two degrees not being safe. This is an idealized two degree warmer planet versus a 1990 planet. And it's a histogram showing that, um, uh, that the number of storms, the number of hurricanes actually decreases. But the number of category fives increases. You can see that as, a, as the, uh, the histogram. Uh, in this case, blue is the climate, to the present day, and red is the warmer future, two degree warmer future. And um, in fact, the number of cat three, four, and fives increases in a statistically significant way. So the, to the number of Run of the mill hurricanes goes down, and the number of um, the number of intense storms goes up. Well, this has two impacts. The obvious one is that more intense storms means more damages to the places that get make, where that makes landfall. But there's an impact of having the less weak storms because in some parts of the world, particularly Taiwan and even in the southeast United States, <clears throat> the water budget, the water availability, is controlled by having a couple of tropical storms go through every year. And so if if, none, if, if you have a year in Taiwan where you don't have any hit in northern Taiwan, they have water problems. So the impacts are of this change in the distribution of hurricane intensities on, is important on both the high and the low end. This is an expensive calculation. This one that I, that I showed you took, I used just about 8,000 processors on Hopper, which is a Cray XE6, I think. Um, um, it took five and a half million processor hours, and um, um, this slide's a little out of date because actually there's some news on this. Um, I've been awarded what is probably the largest single allocation for um, a climate one climate problem. Um, yet on, on this machine that has 750,000 processors, which is a IBM Blue Gene Q at the Argonne National Laboratory, and they gave us 150 million hours 
it's probably about half the speed of the, the Cray, so um, we're going to be able to run a lot more simulations and get much better statistics. And um, so that's extremely exciting. Um, I might actually change models, and I'll show you. I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, I'm not going to tell talk too much about co-design, but that actually has very interesting um, uh, um, possibilities for how to design machines that would be more efficient for climate change. And um, I've written a paper about that in this journal that you see here. Or you can just search Green Flash in Berkeley, because Green Flash was the name of the project. So let's talk about how climate change is actually modeled. Um, there's a lot of factors that influence climate change. And that's, this is one of the reasons why the models are so, so expensive. Um, there's a lot of things you have to do. You have to, 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 uh, to simulate all these processes in the atmosphere, as well as the motion of the atmosphere. Um, you've got to do the same in the ocean, um, the sea ice, and more recently the land ice, because what happens to the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets is very important to, um, to uh, um, the sea future sea level rise. Um, and the biosphere interacts with... Uh, with, carbon with the, the climate system. You increase in a carbon dioxide, some plants actually benefit from that a little bit, but you increase the temperature and they may not. And so, um, so that's complicated as well. So this is all the stuff that's in uh, uh, current generation um, uh, models, uh, the atmospheric general circulation model, which is the stuff that we were originally doing in 1990. Um, uh, has two parts, the equations of motion, the dynamics, and then what they call the physics, which I always thought kind of funny, you know, it's all physics, um, but it's really subgrid scale parameterized physics, so the turbulence, the radiation transport, and the clouds being the most important. Um, the ocean is mostly dynamics, although you do have to approximate turbulence. Sea ice is interesting because, and ice in general is interesting because it's a fluid, but it's an a visco elastic fluid, and so the equations are very different than the Navier-Stokes equations, which are the equations of motion for uh, the atmosphere and the ocean. The land doesn't move, um, at least on these time scales, um, so there's no dynamics, but there's uh, complicated biology that, that, you're, that is important if you want to keep track of where carbon goes. And some problems are, um, you must do atmospheric chemistry as well, and this latest model um, the CAM-5 that I showed you this, the movies from has two modes, one of which was uh, the way I ran it, where most of the chemistry was specified um, from files from a previous run. Um, but you can actually do all that interactively, and it has 28 interacting aerosol species. And it, what it does is change the balance of the computational part of the code. It becomes a much more of an advection problem the, the, uh, um, in order to make that that code efficient, you, you, um, you have to make advection efficient. And that's actually how they've been able to exploit graphical um, uh, GPUs um, a little bit, because porting these codes from one machine to another can be difficult, and rewriting in a different language like for GPUs is very difficult, because there's just so many lines, or millions of lines probably in this thing. Um, but the advection was just one set of routines, and so given that the bulk of the expense of a chemistry transport model, some of these chemistry transport models will have hundreds of, it, of uh, advected uh, uh, scalar quantities. Um, uh, it, it, that actually pays off. But technology is still a limiting factor. And, um, and uh, as I mentioned, at one kilometer, we, we need an order of 28 uh, petaflop sustained, which is well above what anybody gets right now, especially in the U.S. Um, one of the, so they're computationally expensive because there's a lot of stuff, which that cartoon showed, but also um, that there's a time step limitation to the equations of motion called the Courant condition, um, where um, uh, the, um, the grid spacing and, is, and the uh, maximum velocity <clears throat> or wind speed um, are relate, uh, control the time step. And that time step gets smaller as you go to higher resolution. And um, they're typically minutes, tens of minutes maybe, going down to just single digit minutes or even seconds at kilometers. And there are a lot of minutes in a century. And so um, that makes it a sort of a what they call a stiff problem. 
So this is the, towards the end. I, I want to finish up on an example that I like to give to this class because it, it, it's an illustration of, um, of some of the processes that one goes into uh, building a model. Now this is going to be just one task, and that's simulate the dynamics of the atmosphere. But the lesson I hope you will take home from this is it's in, for any kind of, uh, of uh, scientific computing, the reason you're using a computing is you can't solve the equations analytically. And there are choices to be made. I'm going to run through some choices. They, they, sometimes one is more defensible than another. Many times it's not, and there's a judgment call of which works better for one, uh, which particular application you're in. So simulate the dynamics of the atmosphere. The first thing you know, the Earth is a, is a sphere, pretty much, at least on these scales it is. And so we'll discretize the planet and apply these equations of motion, which are the two-dimensional Navier-Stokes equation. So the model that I showed you the simulations from was based on this kind of a grid. Um, if you looked at a globe and looked at lines of latitude and longitude, you would see this kind of plot. Um, typically, they're uniform in the solid angles that define these kind of lines. Um, you'll notice that the cells are not uniform, and in fact, they're convergent at the poles. That's why it's called a polar singularity. Um, simplest polar singularity there is. Um, and, uh, but it's easy to put the equations of motions on these kinds of grids. Um, in fact, dynamicists and all sorts of other applications use uh, regular, regular grids like this. And you could do either finite difference or finite volume, which are two different ways of, uh, of, um, of, of discretizing the equations. And here are the issues. The, the, this first one that I mentioned, the Quran stability criterion, uh, is shown here that, that the, the, temperature, the time step has to be less than the grid spacing divided by the maximum wind speed. And as you get closer to the pole, this convergence of the lines of constant uh, longitude, the meridians, um, makes this time step go down, and, um, and, and that makes the calculation more expensive. And beyond that, the, 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 the doing a simulation across the pole, and that happens a lot of times, um, when you have those very cold events in the United States in the winter, that's a cross-polar flow, where, where, where flow goes across the North Pole, coming from, Russia, from Siberia through Canada, down to the Midwest. That happens a couple times, well, at least once a year. And, um, and uh, doing that kind of simulation is hard because you're, you're going through this polar, this singular point. There is a solution to the, the time step restriction that's kind of fancy. Um, you recognize that that high resolution at the pole is actually a false high resolution because a wave that goes through that is then resolved, but eventually it's going to go down by the equator and then it's not resolved. And so when it comes back into the high resolution, it doesn't magically get re-resolved. And so, um, so you can filter out that, that high resolution by, by some fancy filtering. Um, uh, this is a Fourier filter. Um, typically, you try to use a fast Fourier filter. Um, uh, there are issues putting that on parallel computers at, these, at the size of these, these, uh, the, these filter lengths. But it's very commonly used. It was used in, I, I mentioned CAM4 and CAM5, the, the publicly available community atmospheric model. But prior to being used in CAM4 and CAM5, there was another model called CCEM, Community Climate Model. Um, and I used a very successful, this, this method was very successful from the 1970s through just the last couple of years, called the Spectral Transform Method. So this is an entirely different way of doing the problem. <clears throat> and instead of using a grid, you map the equations of motion onto spherical harmonics, which I show here by this equation. And so this means that instead of calculating finite differences, which, you know, is reasonably straightforward, you're calculating uh, Fourier transforms, usually fast Fourier transforms, or Legendre transforms, or and Legendre transforms. And um, uh, they're typically called by these, uh, these kind of T numbers. Uh, T42 means you have a triangular truncation of this, this uh, series um, with 42 wave numbers. Um, so you don't have difference equations. You've got these transforms. You can, this, this worked really well on the vector machines because the, uh, the vendors supplied um, very fast um, uh, uh, software to do this. Um, 
Uh, it's not the case anymore, but there are fast, there are fast libraries out there. Um, the advantage is basically there are no singular points, and so the time step criteria, it still has a time step criterion to it, but it doesn't change where you're on the globe. It's uniform. And it's very accurate for smooth flows on two-dimensional. It, it doesn't scale very well. Um, the Fourier transform would scale as m squared, which is the length of the series. The fast Fourier transform scales as m log m, where m is the length. But the other algorithm scale is m. So it's, um, it doesn't scale as well with resolution. And so, uh, oh, and another problem is uh, something called spectral ringing, which is a picture I showed here from a calculation I just pulled off of a database, um, showing a, um, uh, it's hard to see here. This is precipitation. And so you have high precipitation over the Andes here in South America. But this line here, see this little light blue line? That's completely false. That's, that's, a, that's, that's basically a ringing of these transforms. And so, you know, when interpreting results from these kinds of models, you have to know that kind of stuff, that they don't work, it doesn't work well in areas of steep topography, which then gets worse as you go to higher resolution, because you're representing the topography better. <coughs> so I was just interested in your point there about there not being parallel FFTs for the values of M you're interested in. What values of M are you talking about? Hundreds. And parallel FFTs typically have to be 10,000 to be efficient, or more, more, maybe even more than that. They can be very efficient, and my friend, I don't know if Andrew Canning spoke this year, no, but he's a colleague of mine, a material scientist, and, and they're very efficient um, three-dimensional fast Fourier transforms that they use in material science, but they're very much longer. So again, it's the back to the modeling question. You know, sometimes algorithms work better on some kind of problems than on others. We did talk about how to paralyze those big FFTs. Yeah, earlier. okay, yeah, 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 very good. Um, I'm not going to say much about this, except that, you know, a bunch of people, including myself, had said, you know, you're never going to go to really super high resolutions with this, me with this methodology because of these scaling issues. But the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, of course, pr proved us all wrong and has gone to uh, T1000, so over 1,000 wave numbers which is in like the 50 kilometer scale um, fairly efficiently. But you have to remember what kind of center the, your, the European center is. Um, they have one code. They got a machine that, it, that they, they, they optimize that code for. And they got an army of software guys that are very, very talented. Um, so most people's codes do not scale well because they don't have those advantages. So institutional differences actually play an important role too in how you, uh, in how you design a problem or how you design a code. <clears throat> Here's the one I like a lot. Um, this is um, used by a number of people, uh, some of our collaborators at the Colorado State University. And here you assume uh, that the sphere is an icosahedron, which is this n equals 1. Um, you have a question? Yeah, uh, in the last slide, you are kind of talking about you know, how different institutions manage the code and design it. Yeah. I was wondering if uh, any of the groups that you've worked with have had any kind of favorite tools or practices that might be interesting to talk about? Well, they all have their favorites. <laughs> or maybe languages. Um, um, uh, Fortran is the, is, is the most commonly used language. Um, uh, where the differences come is in the analysis programs, actually. Let, let's get back to that. Let me finish through these examples, and then we'll, we'll open it up. So the icosahedron is this, this funny-looking shape made out of triangles. Uh, the, under n equals 1. So the way you do this is imagine that this is a child's toy, a, uh, a ball, or an inflatable icosahedron, and you over pump it. You know, pump it enough, it becomes round. And so if you bisect each of these, uh, these, ver these, these uh, sides of the triangle, you can make a, make a mesh out of it. And that's what we've shown here for, um, for uh, um, uh, two and then, then four bisections. And in fact, um, the state of the art now is to do 12 bisections, and that gives you a mesh of 2 kilometers. And actually, the Japanese have done a 14 one. Um, and uh, it's very su ideally suited for finite differences. It's a very uniform mesh, which means this current condition actually is very uniform and more accurate for that. But the connectivity of this mesh is complicated. 
In fact, it has um, special points at the vertices, the original vertices of the icosahedron, where the connectivity is different. And um, that problem was solved about 15 years ago. And um, you can still, you will always have some imprint from the mesh. And you can design idealized test problems that will show that. But the, the real motion is chaotic. And if you get the errors from this, 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 this special case, this special connectivity case, low enough, it no longer matters to the, uh, to the accuracy of a real flow. It's in production use by Deutsche Wetterdienst, the weather prediction service. But, but uh, my favorite is a Japanese model called, um, oh, it just slips my mind now. But they, they have run 400, uh, with a 400 meter global calculation on the machine called the K machine, which is on an island in uh, Kyoto, I think. And um, then they were able to get 0 0.9 petaflops sustained, which is a world record for this kind of a model. But it doesn't run faster than real time. So it takes a couple of days to do a day at this. So we still need to get, um, uh, in order to do this at 1,000 times real time, which is a metric that I have been touting as what you need to be to be uh, um, uh, uh, sustainable, to, to be uh, um, useful scientifically, one would have to be um, very close to uh, 100 petaflops, if not an exaflop sustained. But I am confident that those kind of sustained computational rates will happen in the career spans of, of the students in this room. And we will have a lecture on exaflop machines uh, next Thursday. Very good. This should say cube sphere, not cube so here. Um, the cube sphere is, a, is, is the model that I'm thinking of changing to um, for my huge allocation on the blue gene cube at Argon. And here, the, instead of starting with a high costahedron, you start with a square child's toy and you over pump it. And in this case, the discretization is as shown. It's really quite straightforward. It's logically rectangular on, on, a, on the faces, original face of the cube. So its connectivity is better. It has special points um, here at the original corners of the, uh, of the cube. And its disadvantage is if you maintain orthogonality, it's not as spatially uniform as icosahedron, but you can relax that by, or you can get back to a fairly uniform mesh by um, relaxing the orthogonality. That has effects on the uh, finite difference equations in that you have cross terms, so instead of just having uh, d by dx and d squared by dx, you have d squared by dx dy. Um, but those can be, that's relatively straightforward, and it does not add that much computationally um, uh, complexity, to, computational complexity to the model. The, um, it's used by two major U.S. groups. Um, this version of CAM that I'm going to be uh, using called uh, uses a spectral element method, which I don't understand the dynamics very well, uh, the details very well. Um, it's also called HOME sometimes. And then the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab has gone to this with a finite volume discretization, and they're they're showing some really interesting calculations at three and a half kilometers. I, they had a great one at a conference I was at of Hurricane Sandy um, that was unbelievably realistic. But finally, just to show you something weird, um, is a creative mesh for, for ocean modeling. On the ocean, um, the South Pole is easy because you can do a latitude-longitude grid and the polar singularities over the Antarctica, there's no ocean there. So you don't have to worry about all these convergence problems. Um, but the North Pole, of course, has an ocean. But you can do a orthogonal transformation in the spherical coordinates and move the pole. And this, this, is, this is the mesh that looks like that. And so you move the North Pole in the mesh to, um, to North America. And this isn't even the worst weird one. The one that they're using now, and I don't have a picture of it, they take the pole and through this orthogonal transformation they split it and they put and you turn the North Pole into a West Pole and an East Pole, and you put one over Siberia and one over North America, and that mesh is actually very uniform, and that's what's used in, um, in the current portable ocean program terminology. Um, I call that the Winnie the Pooh mesh because there's a great story about 
Christopher Robin and Winnie the Pooh looking for the North Pole, and Pooh Bear asks about the East Pole and the West Pole, and Christopher Robin says, there's one, but nobody ever talks about it. Um, uh, but there was another question that was asked about the uniformity of these meshes, and, um, and Los Alamos and uh, NCAR actually are very much involved in, in uh, developing uh, variable resolution meshes. Um, where one would uh, um, select a region of interest and, um, and uh, um, put high resolution in a particular region. Um, I'm not a great big fan of that for a general application. I can see some re ideas in the ocean where it might be interesting because ocean circulation patterns tend to not move. And so you might want to, um, and what I particularly think is interesting is, is resolving the flow, the ocean flow of the ocean underneath the Antarctic ice shelf because that's an area where heat transport between the ocean and the land ice is critical. Um, and then, and, and, I, and I should have a mesh here for the land ice. Um, there's a project at Berkeley Lab um, written by Dan Martin who has um, ported the equations of, of motion for glaciers to an adaptive mesh. And it turns out that in order to resolve, in order to simulate the retreat of ice sheets due to melting, um, you have to resolve the grounding lines. That's the edge of the, of the, um, of the ice sheet. And, um, and so he's currently running at 250 meters right at the edge, scaling back to four kilometers. And um, um, this is real exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to try to do all of Antarctica with that, with that kind of a problem. Oh, this is, no, that's not interesting. All right, so here's the general lesson. Um, modeling is always a set of compromises. Um, it's not exact. And so you have to remember that when you're interpreting results. And it's important to remember it when you're designing it. Um, the fundamental equations are dictated by your problem. But there are all these factors. Um, the scale that you're interested, um, the accuracy you need, what kind of machine you have. Can, can matter. I mean, if you have a vector machine, which we used to have, is the, the, the algorithm may be different than what you would want for a, um, for a, uh, um, a large scalar machine. A multi-core machine is going to, to um, offer different opportunities than single core machines. So that's, that's the new, new technology. And, and uh, it's not entirely clear which one of these algorithms, to me, is the best for that. And of course, as I mentioned, you know, and was picked up on, these, these institutional issues are important as well. So there are lots of opportunities for computational science. Um, uh, I don't think that any modeling group that doesn't have a significant investment in computational scientists is going is successful. I mean, that, that that's just a blanket statement. I think is is true. Um, we're going to move into a range where we have millions of processors on a machine with their multi-core chips with complicated networks that, that, um, that can, can be exploited to our advantage if we're clever. Uh, we need much higher efficiencies. 5% of peak performance is considered good. Um, a lot of people don't get anywhere near that. Um, and so that, that's, that's unacceptable in the future as power costs continue to increase. And this issue of large databases, um, uh, the, 100, the 100 terabytes of model output that we made is by far larger than, than most groups had ever made. Um, and for, my, for this proposal that I wrote that they awarded us all this time, I plan to make three petabytes of model output. I'm going to give most of that away because I can't, um, I, you know, there, there, there's more information in that than I could possibly, uh, possibly do myself. Um, I'll use most of it one time, but other people will be able to use it for other purposes. Um, I have a visitor right now who's interested in, in European storms. Um, I'm not going to do anything with European storms, but he can use the same database to, 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 uh, to, um, to answer his question. So dis distribution of model output, of climate model output is critical. And how do you do that on at the petabyte scale? So it used to be called, climate change used to be called the grand challenge program, problem when they were talking about grand challenges. It's still grand challenge. Um, and as I mentioned, you need to have a good mix of, uh, of talent. And the path, I think, is relatively clear. You know, higher resolution, larger ensembles, more runs. 
um, and more sophisticated physical parameterizations, and all this is expensive. And um, fortunately, we've benefited from investments in this, in this field, and I think we will continue to. So I'll leave you with an editorial. I've probably given you more than one, but I'll give you this one. Um, my generation has done a reasonably good job identifying that there's a problem with climate change. Uh, general public goes back and forth about accepting this. I think that most people do. Um, but what do we do about it? And uh, that's a really difficult question, and computational science plays a big role in, in how to inform the public to make better decisions. Here's some, here's some more um, um, resources on, uh, on, on, on what I've talked about today. The last one, uh, the Earth System Grid and, um, and, and the, the PCMDI site in the middle, that's where data is available if you want to play with data. All you got to do is sign up and you can download anything you want. So thank you, and I've probably run out of time for questions, but I'm happy to take them. So um, I, I think nobody's going to throw us out of the room. So if you have time for I questions. I have plenty of time, yeah. So I, um, I'll, I'll just ask one, then I have to run off to a meeting. So we had John Shelf talk about what it took to get teams of scientists with very different backgrounds, especially, say, computer scientists and physical scientists, to collaborate on big uh, frameworks of software. Uh, that must be an issue in this field, too. Well, John and I actually did, um, as you know, um, for this Green Flash program. And um, it was really interesting because um, I found it very rewarding because the, uh, we had a team of hardware engineers, software engineers, and then climate, science, climate modelers um, all on the same project. And um, at the beginning, we all spoke different languages, and um, they didn't understand what I was talking about, and I didn't understand what they were talking about. But by the end, I think we kind of bridged that gap. And, uh, and um, I don't know what the comment to make, other than that, um, from a social, sociological point of view, it's really quite interesting. Um, but I think it has to happen, because um, we can't get the science we need without, um, without the involvement of, of uh, even hardware people. And, we, and, and, um, and they won't give us what we need if they're not talking to us. It's not just going to happen. You know, I think we've changed, the, the, the model has always been, this is a, a personal viewpoint, but the model has always been that we, um, that, that, that physical scientists had just taken whatever machine the c computational community had designed for us, and what can we do with it? And so, so the question you ask is, what can you do with the machine you have? And I actually think we need to turn this around and be more like, um, um, the Hubble or the uh, or the or the um, the, L the Large Hadron Collider, and say, what kind of machine do we need to do the science that we want? And um, computational science has, and computational physics has advanced enough in the last recent years that I think that that's a a a a, a better way of uh, of proceeding forward, and that's just starting to happen. Any other questions? Well, thank you. <laughs>